2 Corinthians chapter 12, the first verse, it is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. That's um, actually something that we should all tattoo across our foreheads. It is not profitable to boast. In fact, we probably make things worse for ourselves. Have you ever done that? Uh, just talk about yourself? You go into a conversation and someone is explaining about how you know they had a really rough day and then you interrupt and say oh let me tell you about my day or uh, you know they had this great experience happen to them and you interrupt and say oh let me tell you what happened to me and and then you just kind of one-up them all the time in a sense that's a form of boasting and what it is is, is just trying to throw ourselves higher in the mix um, let me just say that's something we can all work on if we do that, we can work on that. Boasting is, is not a good quality unless you're boasting about someone else. If you're boasting too much about one person other than Jesus, then you're probably driving someone crazy, I'm sure. You know, like your grandkids or your own kids or something like that. You can tend to take it a little too far where if someone just says, enough already, enough already. But Paul is talking about himself here in that I really don't want to boast. I don't want to talk about myself. He's sort of placed in a pickle, if you remember with these chapters we're in right now, especially the last chapter, uh, the super duper apostles that were floating through the Christian church were boasting about themselves. And, and so they were sort of saying, well, that's the apostle Paul. He's just this little fella, unlike us. We're the super duper apostles. Paul is just the little guy and a little old fashioned. He's been around his day is past kind of a thing. So they would sort of downplay him or belittle him. Sometimes the way we can make ourselves look better is by squashing the other person that we think we're in competition with. Paul, as you're going to see by the end of these chapters here, he doesn't want to be in competition with anybody. But he says, all right, I don't want to have to do this. But I will, uh, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. If I'm going to boast, then this is what I'm going to boast about. Let me tell you what the Lord did in my life. Now, it's, it's sort of a, a reluctant boasting, but nonetheless, he has to do this. And he finds himself talking about these, these, this special vision, this special revelation that the Apostle Paul had. Now, as you go into the book of Acts, there's a couple of different times, about three or four times, when Paul actually talks about the visions and the revelations that he had. They were quite impressive. Uh, it's something that we know through the scriptures that it is possible for people to receive visions and revelations. The Old Testament describes that. The New Testament describes that. If it's something that happened in the Old Testament, we can almost be sure that it's not going to be less for us today, meaning that it's surely possible for God to reveal certain things to us, and very often supernaturally. Many of the things that God reveals to us are, are quite natural, or at least they appear to be natural. When God reveals supernatural things to us, it's very possible they come across naturally. You may say, oh, I had a great idea. And that great idea may have actually been a revelation of the Lord, something that God has been speaking to. And you'll just go and do it. You won't even think twice about it. But it was God granting you a bit of wisdom for a specific uh, circumstance or situation that helps you to advance uh, his cause or even a good cause that's going to bless you or others in some way. And so God can reveal things. But then there are specifics in the ministry, specifics about about heaven, about Jesus, about your relationship to him. And sometimes God, through his miraculous work of the Spirit, is able to open up your eyes. That's what vision is. Open up his, your eyes to see what others cannot see, to see what is perhaps behind the veil in a place that, that only those with supernatural revelation will be able to see. Not everyone's going to witness that or experience it. Paul did. And because he had such revelations, such visions, in this particular case, he says, all right, I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to tell you what I know. We uh, uh, are privileged, of course, to hear what he's saying. And, but the problem is he still chokes a bit on his own words about himself. And so he speaks of himself in the third person. I know a man. 
in Christ, who 14 years ago had this experience, this revelation, this vision, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know, but God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. Now, this is uh, most likely, we, we almost are certain he's speaking of himself, especially once we get down to verse 7. We know he's talking about himself, but he just can't bring himself to boast about himself. And so he's bringing himself to this place of, of uh, let me tell you about this guy. The guy is me, but I don't want to talk about me. I want to talk about what I saw. <coughs> Excuse me. And he said it was about 14 years ago. We're not sure where that would have put him. Uh, it's possible it was when he was in Syria and he was uh, off by himself, growing in the Lord himself. We're not sure. But he had this vision, this vision he's going to describe in a bit. Whether he was in his body or out of his body, he didn't know. Strange this out-of-body experience that the apostle is, is sort of wrestling with. I don't know where I was. Now, we have that in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation. We have the revelation of Jesus Christ as seen through the eyes or the experience, the vision of the apostle John. In there, in, in the first chapter, he said that he was in the Spirit on the, on the Lord's day. And he heard a voice, and he turned to see who that voice was, and it was the Lord. And the Lord began to speak to him. We get into chapter 4, and then he hears the voice again that says, Come up here, and I will show you the things that must happen after these things. And as he hears that, suddenly it says, I was taken up into heaven. And that's where he was to experience the, the vision of the revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, and what the last days would look like. And so there is this out of body, in the body, we're not sure experience that Paul had, or that John had. Paul had something extremely similar where he says he was caught up to the third heaven. The words there, caught up, is the um, Greek word harpazo. You might be familiar with that from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 if you've ever studied what we call the rapture of the Christian church. This word harpazo means to snatch away violently. And uh, if you've ever played jacks, that's what that's like. You know, you drop the ball and you snatch the jacks right off the ground before the ball bounces again. That's to snatch away. And so what Paul was saying is, here I was in the body, out of the body, I don't know, but I was snatched into paradise. Harpazo, that's what it means, to snatch away violently, meaning very, very quickly. And that was his experience. And he was taken, he says, to the third heaven, the third heaven. And uh, uh, this third heaven has been some speculation, but it's very simply, there is the first heaven, which is the atmosphere of air where we breathe, the air that we breathe. The birds fly in the air. Today, airplanes fly in the air. That's the first heaven. The second heaven would be where the stars reside, the moon and uh, the planets, that's the, the second heaven. And the third heaven is believed to be the place where God resides. And uh, that becomes the eternal realm, the third heaven. So Paul is saying that in this day, this particular time, I was taken up, snatched into the third heaven, the place where God lives. And then he says, and I know such a man. I, he's probably thinking, I couldn't believe it was me. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, but God knows how he was harpazo, snatched away. That's where we do get our word rapture. It is a word that is typically translated into the uh, Latin version. The Latin version is raptus, and that is this word rapture that we have transliterated, and that's where we get it from. And so he was raptured into paradise. And there it says, paradise is a euphemism here for heaven, we assume, and he was taken to some place so beautiful, he said, and heard inexpressible words. Inexpressible words. The word inexpressible here is a word that means highly sacred. In other words, he said, I heard things and probably saw things so sacred 
that I don't even know how to explain them to you. I can't repeat them. Wouldn't that be something to be able to see that? Well, let me just remind you, you will. You will see that when you go to heaven. And uh, right now, we search our brains. We try to conjure up in our imagination what we think heaven will be. And we imagine what it will be. We have clues. We have bits and visions that are given to us in the Bible. And we, we imagine what heaven might be like. And there really, I have to tell you, isn't enough in the Bible about heaven that gives us a clear picture of what heaven is going to look like. But what Paul is saying here is it's fantastic. It's like nothing that we have on this earth, so much so I can't explain it to you. That's what heaven is. And it gives me the expectation of a wonderful experience when we do get into that place called heaven, which he says is not lawful for a man to utter. These words are so sacred that I would be breaking the law if I even tried to explain it to you. That's his version. That's his, his story, and he's sticking to it. He says, of such a one, I will boast. I'll boast about that guy because that's a guy that I envy. Now he's back down to earth now and he's back into his normal routine and his normal body. He's no longer able to see that vision and he envies that guy who did see that. And I wish I was there with him again is what he's thinking and I want to envy that guy. I'll boast about what that guy saw but me, I'm, I'm just down here in my infirmities. He says there in verse 5, of such a one I will boast Yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. And the word infirmities there just simply means my weaknesses. I'll boast in how weak I am. Now this is sort of a strange thing because that's not something we typically boast about. That we're weaklings, you know, we're, we're needy people. Uh, that's typically a sign of weakness, nothing to boast about. We see someone behaving that way and we sort of want to say, come on, man, pull, pull your uh, boots up and, and, and get tough, you know, toughen up. What's wrong with you? We see that as a terrible thing. But Paul says, not, not when it's coming to the spiritual life. When, it, when, it, when it's involving this spiritual life, the weaker we are, the more the power of God gets the glory and gets the praise. So don't think of this in the sense where I have to be a, a sissy or I have to be a weakling. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying, I know that I'm, I'm weak. I'm, I know that I don't have the great abilities that you're wanting in the great Apostle Paul. I can't match up to your expectations. That's where all of these criticisms of him were coming. They, they were criticizing him because he's, he's just all talk. He's all bark. And his bark gets louder the further away from Corinth he gets. And that was his criticism. And he's basically apologizing here that he's so weak. I'm sorry if you think I'm so weak, but let me tell you what I saw and why I feel that's a privileged position. That's what he was saying. That's an experience worth boasting about. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool. There is the desire in all of us, but it is something, boasting is something that we need very much to resist. Resist boasting about yourself, but instead seek the glory of Jesus in all of your life. Talk about him and talk about others in a good way and let others honk your horn and, and, and ring your bell in that sense. Don't talk about yourself. It's not easy, I know, because it's probably one of our greatest dangers is self-seeking self and self-ambition and self-pride. But Paul said, I, though I desire to boast, I'll not be a fool, for I will speak the truth, but I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what needs me to be or hears from me. I, I tell you more about this ex experience in heaven, but I might be slipping over a line where it'll make you think like I'm trying to exalt myself so that you'll think of me better. I don't want you to do that. I, I think Paul is, is saying quite, quite simply, I want you to think of Jesus that way, not me. Yeah, I've had great experiences, but I want you to have your own experiences. I want you to go out and experience God in this way. Now, listen, I'm, I'm not a fan of what they call experience-based Christianity. There are people who seek after signs and miracles and, and wonders and all sorts of things that, that uh, um, 
may or may not be genuine. That's not the point. The point is, is those aren't things we should be seeking after. I want to seek after the Lord. Jesus said the end of the gospel of, of Mark. He said those who seek the Lord will experience supernatural things. That, that, but these things will follow those who believe, is what he said. And so we believe in the Lord, we follow the Lord, we grow close to the Lord, and in so doing, we're going to experience the Lord. I want to experience the Lord. I don't need to experience signs and wonders necessarily. I just want to experience the Lord and everything that that entails and what comes will come. And I'm okay with whatever comes just so long as I have Jesus in the midst of it. That's what we want to have. That's got to be the mindset. We, and we often have to train our minds for that. If we come out of the world, we only have perhaps worldly experiences, whether they're party experiences or, or, or sensual experiences or what are bad experiences, all kinds of experiences we have from the world. And so we're a little hesitant about experience. Others come out of different religious groups that are always chasing after certain types of emotional experiences or, or wondrous experiences. And so we're a little skeptical about what we're going to experience in the Lord. We just want the Lord to be in charge of all that. Put him in charge of it, and don't make yourself a, a, a seeker of those things. Seek Jesus, and let him be the giver of all good things. And so right now he says, I'm just going to hold back. I don't want to tell you my experience, lest you should think something above what you should be thinking about me. And so I'm going to resist this boasting about myself. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. So here he's saying, I have had so many things I've seen God do. I've had so much revelation, so much experience with God. God doesn't want me to have pride in myself. That's what he says, lest I should be exalted above measure. That's, that's proud, being too proud. Thinking you're, you're something special because you have had so many experiences with the Lord. And there is that, that, that line again that people will cross. That they have these experiences and they suddenly think, start to think that they are special because not everyone else is having as many experiences as I'm having. And you may have run across some people like that who love to tell you thus that this is what the Lord has shown me. This is what the Lord has told me. And you walk away after a conversation and you think, boy, I don't, God doesn't talk to me like that. You ever ran into people like that? God's always talking to them. It's like they've become God's counselor. God came to me the other day, and he needed to know what to do with you. <laughs> Fortunately, I told him what he can do to you. And so we, we think that, and we have this insecurity when you hear people talking like that. The Lord did this. The Lord did that. The Lord did this. The Lord did that. And I usually don't say anything. I kind of you know, go in my prayer closet and pray for maturity uh, on myself for the things I'm thinking. So I have to grow out of that. So, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, designed here as we see, to keep me from pride, designed to keep me from being exalted above measure, thinking of myself more highly than I all ought to think. But this thorn in the flesh was given to me, perhaps he's saying, and I'm sure he is, to keep me humble, to remind me of my weakness, my frailty, to remind me that I'm not all it like I think I am. And so there, are, there was this thorn in the flesh. Notice this thorn was given to him. Now, a thorn may irritate you, but it probably won't kill you. It's just a real pain, an irritant. You know, just tonight I was walking backstage, and I got a little sliver from the handrail that's back there in my thumb. It reminds me that the guys need to get some sandpaper. But... Uh, that it, it was irritating me. And I remember I was talking with, uh, with uh, Tommy and, uh, I, I was, uh, and Lorraine. I was sitting out there picking at this thing. And I'm sure they're thinking, pay attention to me. It hurt. It hurt. 
I'm sorry. No, but anyway, that, it's an irritant. It didn't kill me, but it's a pain. Paul had this thorn that irritated him. It bothered him. It probably wasn't minor, but it wasn't going to kill him either. And it was given to him, meaning that God allowed it. He permitted this thorn to happen. In fact, what's weird about it is he calls it in verse 7, a messenger of Satan. So it's given to Paul, in a sense, as God's gift to him. But it was sent by Satan, the messenger of Satan. And it's, he tells us why, to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure. The word buffet there is a word in the Greek which means to punch with the fist. So it's a little more than a, than a, a splinter in your thumb. Punched with a fist. And it means to do violence. So there was this violence that was just a constant nagging that the Apostle Paul constantly had to face. Always was confronted with it. And here he says, concerning this thing in verse 8, I pleaded with the Lord. I begged him three times that it would depart from me. I hated this thing. I hated what was happening. I didn't like what was coming against me. It was just this thorn in my flesh. And it's something that we realize that things don't always go the way we want to go. Now, we're going to call it spiritual warfare. We usually do. You know, oh, what a week of spiritual warfare I'm having. And you see the Facebook posts light up. Pray for me. I'm going through spiritual warfare. You are, but apparently the Lord allows it. And we just pray for God to remove it. But we often speak of this spiritual warfare as if it's a bad thing. Have you ever thought about spiritual warfare as possibly being a good thing? That the devil is actually the, uh, the wooden spoon of God to train his children, to discipline his children, to, to mature his, his children? Because that's certainly the way this verse is reading, these verses here. But it tells us how terrible of a thing pride is because it's everyone's danger. Every one of us is faced with it at some place in some form in our lives. And we have to confront it. And that pride is that temptation to think better of ourselves than we should think. It's not bad to have a, a healthy self-esteem, if you want to call it that. It's not bad at all. But when your self-esteem consumes your life, you've slipped into pride. And there has to be this pressure of the thorn in the flesh that's going to buffet you or punch you in the gut to get you to realize, stop thinking about yourself. That's what it's about. Stop thinking about yourself. Start thinking about other people. And until we get that, it's always going to be that, that thorn, that, that constant pressure. And we're going to try and think of ourselves to the point that we're going to make everything happen for ourselves. And God says, no, I work against the pride. God resists the proud. He doesn't assist the proud. He resists them. He keeps them under and makes it so that they're golden ring is always just out of reach and if you will you're going to constantly chase after that ring but God will always keep it right out of reach and so you're never satisfied because that's what pride does it's just you're constantly wanting more you see someone else who's got more than you and you're not going to be satisfied to have more than that person it's a sense of pride so Paul says, i got to get rid of this thing. It's killing me. I prayed three times with the Lord that, he, that it might depart from me. And the Lord said to me, my grace is enough. My grace combined with this thorn, it's a perfect match. I hate thorns. I really do. It, I hate them. I, I hate whatever that thorn may represent. It's not a good thing. It's not a comfortable thing. Thorns are designed to keep you uncomfortable, at least God's thorns. They're, they're put in your life, they're God's gift to you, so that you won't get comfortable, so that you won't trust in yourselves. He started the letter with that, remember? That you will not trust in yourselves, but in God who raises the dead. That's what a thorn is designed to do, to get you to look to the Lord. And he did, he prayed. 
I want to, Lord, please remove this. Lord, please remove this. Lord, please remove this. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you because, he said, my strength is going to be perfected in your weakness. That's a great match also. Your weakness will accentuate my greatness and my strength. That's what God wants to do. So when our weakness is, is found there in life, then comes the strength of the Lord, and people will look on and say, well, that wasn't him, that was God. God wants everyone to say that it was him helping that person. It was him working through that person, and that's the way we have to be able to see it. So grace is what we're looking for. We're looking for the grace of the Lord. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, Paul says, I will rather boast in my infirmities or my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So the weaker I am, the more power I'm going to have in Christ. And that's, that's what I want. I, I want to get to that place. I don't exactly know how we do that to ourselves other than seeking to be humble. And there's some people who are very strong in many ways. You know, they, the ones who have the ability to organize, the ones who are good with money, the ones who are really good with their hands, all of these people, they're, they're so good at certain things that it's difficult to see the Lord working in those skills that you have. And to, to, it's not that we let those skills go, but to yield them to the Lord and say, Lord, you must have given me these skills for a reason. Now I use them for your glory. Empower me to do more. Let me do more with what you've given to me. So don't despise the good things that God has put in your life. Just know how to surrender them to the Lord and use them for his glory. I take pleasure in, in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. I, I, I don't take pleasure in any of those things. So, uh, but that's the, the, the sign of, of true maturity. Not that you're boasting in uh, your own perfection or ability, but you're boasting that God would, would use you in any way. And you boast in the Lord. And, and so when I am weak, he says, I am strong. More, more uh, God dependence. When I'm weak, I'm dependent on the Lord even more. And that's where we can go for our strength. And that's the sign of maturity. I've become a fool in boasting. I'm sorry about that. But you made me do it. You have compelled me. I've said more than I wanted to say. But I, I, I feel like I had to in this case. For I ought to have been commended by you, for in nothing was I behind in the most eminent apostles or the super duper ones. I, I don't fall behind them. I'm not lacking in anything. But you really should have been defending me to these guys, what, what, there's, what he's saying here. I didn't want to do this, but I'm letting you know how God has used me in my life and what I've gone through. It really was a miracle that I'm able to write this letter to you. And so I want you to, to know that he, he, was, he was saying, you should have stuck up for me. You should have helped me. You should have defended me. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, he says, though I am nothing. In other words, I'm not an impressive figure. I'm not an impressive person. Still, for the sake of what God has done through my life, that's what you should be boasting in. Listen, I don't want you talking about my brother Paul that way. He may be a little fella. He may stutter when he speaks. He may not be the most eloquent speaker. But I'll tell you, God sure has his hand on that man's life. And that's what should have been coming from them, but they didn't. They kind of sold him out. Truly, in verse 12, he's going to continue talking about himself. The signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and in mighty deeds. So in his office, in his ministry of the apostle, there are certain gifts that come along with that. Signs, wonders, mighty deeds. All these are little different variations. We're not going to go into them all, but they're different variations of how God works in that particular office of apostle. And so Paul was, 
was just operating in those signs and wonders and, and, and mighty deeds. And the people saw it. They witnessed it. Wow, that's amazing. That's the power of God. Paul is working the power of God. There's an anointing on his life. And that's why Paul is saying, you saw it, you should have defended that. That it was God. And uh, for what is it in which you were inferior... What is it in which you were inferior to other churches? How did you lack from the other churches except that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me for this wrong. I wasn't a burden to you. Sorry about that. This was sarcasm here. It's really how it's coming, coming off. I wanted nothing of yours. I came to bring you the gospel. And that's how you are different from everyone else in that the other churches supported the work that the Lord was doing through my life, but you guys didn't, to their shame. This was not a good thing. Forgive me this wrong. I should have allowed you uh, to support me, but I didn't, because I didn't want to, whatever his reasoning was, he didn't, he didn't allow it. Now, for the third time, he said, I'm ready to come to you. Three times the third time he's going to go to visit Corinth. The first time was when he founded the church in the book of Acts. The second time was probably, we assume, between the writing of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. So he's just returned now from a second trip there. He's back. He's heard some news. He's responding to it. And now he's planning to take a third trip back to Corinth. And so he says, I'm, I'm ready to come to you, and I will not be burdened, burdensome to you again, he says. I, for I do not seek yours, but you. I'm not after what you have. But at the same time, he was cutting them off from something important because he was saying, I don't want you supporting my ministry. And that's, that's too bad for them because that's the way it sort of falls is that if you support someone who's doing the work of the ministry, whatever they reap as their reward, you share in that reward. So you would really want to be an investor in Paul's ministry because he, was a, 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 he yielded a high um, return with his work. And so you want to get involved in that. Yes, let's support the Apostle Paul. He's winning souls. He's starting churches. Let's get in on that. And Paul says, but I don't want you in on it. You guys are going to have to find some other horse to bet on because it's not going to be me. And that is his way of saying you, you didn't jump in and you needed to. That's immaturity is what he's saying. It's immaturity that you do not see the necessity to support such things. And that is something that it's a lesson for us today. You hear us every Wednesday night, we talk about missions. It's important that we see the need of people that could use a few bucks to help further the work of the gospel. We want to be able to do that. Now, you may have other things, too. You want to feed the homeless, or you want to see someone who's in need, a, a friend or a brother in Christ. You want to give them some money, that's good. But anytime you get to support the advancement of the gospel, that's a very good thing. And so you want to get behind that. That's what Paul is saying. And we, we, it takes a rethinking of our money. Money, we have to rethink money. We, have to, we, we use it, of course, to pay our bills, but we want to be able to take money and use it for the glory of the kingdom. Of course, Paul talked about it earlier in chapters 8 and 9. He mentioned it in 1 Corinthians as well. This was important. He's saying church needs to support the advancement of the gospel. And that's how we see the giving of these funds. And Paul was saying, you're not going to be able to do that with me. You're going to have to find someone else. He says, I will, in verse 15, I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, verse 14, I left off there. He says, I do not seek yours, but you, for the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but parents for the children, and I will gladly spend and be spent for your souls, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. So I'm going to continue doing this for you because I don't want your silver. I don't want your money, no matter what you think. I, I care more about your souls, so I'm going to keep investing in you. You don't have to invest in me. I will invest in you. And that's sort of the right attitude of the minister because we don't, we don't get in this for money. It's the wrong motive, always. 
You're never in it for the money. You, if you are, then you're in it wrongly and you should get out. You want to be in it for the souls of people, to help people. Uh, at the same time, if you're committing yourself to the work of the gospel, then the Bible tells us, Jesus told us, then you have to also be supported by the work of the gospel. So it's a good trade-off. Everybody wins. Did I take, uh, I'm sorry, verse 16. But be that as it may, I did not burden you. I wasn't a burden to you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you by my cunning. In other words, I was skilled at what I did as a fisherman, and I captured you. I caught you in my net of the gospel, even though I was careful with the money thing, and I still brought you into the kingdom. Did I take advantage of you by any of those of, uh, those of, uh, any of those whom I sent to you? Well, it's rhetorical. No, I did not. I urged Titus and sent your brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Well, no, of course not. Did we not walk in the same spirit? Did we not walk in the same steps? We were the same. Titus and I, we didn't take advantage of anybody. Again, do you think that we excuse ourselves to you? We speak before God in Christ. But we, all do, but we do all things, beloved, for your edification. This is one way of preventing pride from getting out of control. As you start to do things, all things, for someone else's edification. Edification means building up. We do all things to try to help others grow in the Lord, to try to help others get ahead in the faith. And don't, uh, don't think that edification here is that you try to help someone get ahead in their finances. That's not necessarily what we uh, are talking about here. Not that it's a bad thing. Paul is only concerned about spiritual things. We often get very tied up with material things. We need to reverse that and start thinking spiritually. And Paul is saying that. I care about you being built up in the faith. And so he says, For I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I wish. I want you built up. I want you matured. But I'm afraid you're not going to be that way when I come there, and that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish, lest there be contentions. In other words, I'm going to find you in a weakened state, and you're going to find me as a lion, and you're not going to want me that way. Paul is showing a bit of frustration. And I'm going to come there, and you're not going to like it because I don't want to find contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, conceits, and tumults or violent explosions. This is the behavior of the world. This is the behavior of the flesh. Paul says, I don't want to come to your church and see the evidence of these things. This isn't what we're, supposed to, what we're supposed to have. Now, this is a very important point here, and I hope I can, I can say it properly. These are things we have to run away from as Christians, first of all, as Christians. But second of all, we have a, a public testimony, a public witness. And in that public witness, we have the opportunity of presenting Christ as the, we are the aroma of Christ, the fragrance of Christ. We have an opportunity to present Christ in a very beautiful way. We live in a day when, when there's so much bickering and anger in our world, in our world. We live in a day when this fragrance of Christ could smell so beautiful the light of Christ can shine so brightly, but sometimes we don't have the, the foresight to practice the love of Christ in that way. Case in point, those of you who are Facebook fans, you know you have an opportunity to be so loving and positive on Facebook, but a lot of people aren't. Some very hurtful things are posted on Facebook in the name of Christianity or in the name of right and in the name of this is the right way to think. But there's a way to say certain things that can be done so differently. Instead, I see a lot of Christian activity that is very cutting 
and very painful to watch. I, I, I listen. I, I'll be honest with you. If it weren't for my desire to to oversee the flock of God that God has put in my care, I probably wouldn't be on Facebook. That's why I got on it in the first place. Because I know that's where our teenagers were, and I wanted to keep an eye on them. So I'm a Facebook stalker. I may never post on your Facebook, but I'm watching. And I'm seeing what you're posting, and I'm not happy. I'm not happy. Believe me, it's, it's all I can do to keep from posting a, a bit of a rebuke. Christian, this is not proper behavior for you. You're to be the light of Christ, not a cesspool. You're to be something that's supposed to be the fragrance of Christ. You're, you're supposed to smell beautiful. And when people see your posts or when people see your face, when people hang around with you, they should envy you for the peace that you walk in. They should envy you for the light that you have. And, and, and if, if they go to your Facebook, in fact, some of you need to go home and, and delete a lot of stuff off your Facebook pages. Anything offensive or cutting, Christians, let me tell you something. In our day, stay out of politics. Stay out of politics because if you're not exalting Jesus, you'll be wrong no matter what you say. It's possibly so right that you're wrong. And that's how so many Christians are. And it's a bad, bad witness. It's a terrible witness. And we're giving Jesus a bad, bad name. We need to change that. Now, this isn't at all what Paul was talking about. That's what I'm talking about. But still, there are these contentions and jealousies and outbursts of wrath, and selfish ambitions and backbitings and whisperings and all of these things and Facebook and all that. It's probably not going to be the last time you'll hear me say that because uh, I think I've about had it with it. Lest when I come again, and he's coming again, he's coming back to him, he said, my God will humble me among you. <laughs> uh, I'm going to lose it. I'm going to lose it. <laughs> and, and you don't want me to lose it in front of you. And I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness which they have practiced. This will be the third time. He says it again. I am coming to you. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. And he's saying, I've been there two or three times now. I'm the witness against you. I know you probably better than anybody is what he's saying. So I'm telling you, you got to get it right. You got to get it straight. I've told you before and foretell as if I were present a second time and now being absent, I write to, to those who have sinned before and to all the rest that if I come again, I will not spare. I will not spare the rod, is what he's saying. I'm coming, and I'm going to spank you. And you're not going to like it. This little Apostle Paul, you think I'm, I'm just this little, tiny little guy. Oh, he speaks so tough when he's so far away. Well, I'm coming with a hammer, is what he's saying. I'm going to straighten out the church, because the church is behaving wrongly. He's talking to the church. He's not talking to the world. We have, we have no business judging what the world does. We really need to worry about what we're doing and be the bug light. We'll, we'll, not bud light, bug light. <laughs> we're the bug light. You shine and bugs are attracted to you. That's what we have to do. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, since if that's what you want, who is not weak toward you, but mighty in you, that's what you want, I'll give it to you. For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves, therefore, as to whether you are in the faith. Are you really a Christian? That's what he's saying. You need to check it out. Check yourself out. Because I'm coming to examine you. You should examine yourself before I get there. Are you really in the faith? And his point is, if you're really in the faith, then why haven't you repented from your sins? Why do you still have, as he said, the last verse of chapter 12, uncleanness, that's sexual uncleanness and fornication and lewdness, which they have practiced. This is things you're practicing. 
And he says there in that verse, you haven't repented of them. Why is that? Are you in the faith or not? Because Christian, if you're in the faith, well, that implies that you've become a new creation. And if you're a new creation, then the old habits, the, the things he, he lists there in verse 20 of chapter 12, those are things we have to separate ourselves from. Get them off of us. Get rid of those things. You say, well, hey, hey we're only human. Well, who did Jesus die for? You, humans. We, humans, is who he died for. He didn't die for the puppy dogs. He died for us to change us. This Sunday is Easter, beautiful Easter. But he didn't die for one day so that you can have a whole different experience on a Sunday, one Sunday out of 52 of them. He died to change your whole life. And that's what he wants to see. And he says, you need to examine yourselves to see whether or not you're in the faith. Test yourself. That word test, there's dokemazo. Document. Test yourself. Again, it's the uh, idea of examine. Test yourselves. We're, we're too busy testing everyone else. We're judging everyone else, examining everyone else's lives. And we don't have time to test our own lives. We want to set everyone in the world straight. So we can go on Facebook and post that nasty thing so that two people will like it. We think we've changed the world. <laughs> Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves? Do you not know whether you're in the faith that Jesus Christ is in you? Do you not even realize it? Unless indeed you are disqualified. The word test is dokemazo. The word disqualified is adokemazo. The A means untested. The the UN, the un, un, or without. And so one is being tested, the other is untested. Meaning you'll stand before God embarrassed because you never tested yourself. But I trust that you will know that we are not adokemazo. We are not, we have not failed the test. We know who we are, Paul is saying. We've been through this. You know, he talked about all the things that he suffered for Christ. Anyone who was not proven would have ditched this lifestyle a long time ago. Oh no, we've been through it, Paul said. Now you need to examine yourself because when the trouble comes, who will turn and run or who will stand? Because the trouble is coming. The trouble is coming. It's coming to America. It's coming to America. And I just want to remind you Christians, how much we're whining now when there hasn't even been hardly any persecution at all. Think of how much we whine now. Meaning, we need to examine ourselves. Now I pray to God that you do no evil. In other words, don't, don't get vindictive on me. Don't get yourself all... Uh, you know, upset by what I'm saying and, and run off and do something crazy. Don't get all upset about what I'm saying and do something that you're going to regret. I pray to God that you do no evil. Not that we should appear approved. Not that you have to agree with everything we're saying, but that you should do what is honorable. Whether you agree with us or not, whether you think we are who we say we are or not is irrelevant. You need to behave honorably. You need to act rightly. Do the right thing. Always. That's the Christian, that's a Christian thought. Always do the right thing. You may not like what, what people are saying. It may bother you to watch the news. It may bother you to hear what people are doing in the name of, of fairness when it doesn't seem fair at all. And it may trouble you. But that doesn't give us permission to spout off. We should always do and say the right things, even when inside I don't like it. That's walking in the spirit and the obedience of the Lord. And so do the honorable thing, though we may seem disqualified, though you may have a different opinion of us. It doesn't matter. What you do is what's important. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. Don't, we don't want to do anything that that violates the truth, 
opposes the truth or damages the truth. We want to manifest or defend the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. And this also we pray that you may be made complete. So listen, we don't mind if you think we're the, the weaklings here, we're the bad guys here. We don't mind that. Just so long as you stay in the right path. You get strong in the process. We don't care. We'll, we'll be called the, the weak bunch. You just get strong. For we are glad that, so that you may be made complete. And the word complete here is, is whole or mature. That's the goal. This is for your maturity. And uh, I'll be weak if you'll grow up. Therefore, I write these things being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the other, meaning a, a, a sharper tone. I don't want to have to do that. So I'm, I'm writing these things before I get there so that hopefully when I get there, we can clear the air about all these things and you will have already learned the lesson, repented of your sins, and get, get on track because that's why I'm coming. I'm coming to get you on track. And so let's, hopefully he says it would be a nice way according to the authority, the, the biblical and the anointed anointing upon his life, which the Lord has given to me, for edification, not for destruction. I'm not coming to destroy you. I'm coming to fix you. I'm coming to edify you, to build you up. That's my God-given gift, is what he's saying. That's why I'm coming. And so I want to be able to build you up. But he's, he's giving them this warning. So take heed to what I'm saying. Finally, brethren, farewell. Greek word meaning rejoice. Finally, brethren, rejoice. I know this hurts, but you know, take joy in what I'm saying. It's good for you. Sometimes it feels uh, it, it's good to feel bad. Sometimes, and this is one of those cases when you've been told off. No one likes to be told off, but Paul is telling them off, and he's saying you need to get your lives right. This is important stuff. And so there are times when you have to do that with someone that you love. So rejoice. Be complete. There's that word again of wholeness or maturity. Be mature. Be encouraged or good comfort here. Encouraging one another. Be of one mind or of harmony. Living in peace. That's what harmony does. It brings, brings the body in peace. The bickering, of course, the contentions, the jealousies will damage all of that. But he's saying there has to be unity in the body of Christ. There has to be. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want the God of love to be with them? Who doesn't want the God of peace to be with them? Of course we do. So we have to do something so that the God of love and peace will always feel welcome in our midst. If we're bickering and fighting, that's not. there's no evidence there that God is in our midst. Where God is, there should be liberty, there should be unity, there should be harmony and peace. Greet one oh, and and the God of, I already read that. Verse 12, greet one another with a holy kiss, emphasis on holy. Holy kiss here. We, we simply just have Christian hugs. We hug. You know, the congregation of saints is, is usually a hugging place. It's a good thing. And it should be a, a warm place, a happy place, um, and a place of, of, of Christian love. All the saints greet you, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Now, did you notice that in verse 14? The Trinity. Did you see that? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, all three of them, of course, is what we call the Trinity. And of course, there are critics to the Trinity. They say there's no such word in the Bible. It's true. There is no such word as Trinity, but there is the doctrine of the Trinity from Genesis to Revelation. You cannot escape it unless you just want to. But you cannot escape the teaching of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's throughout Scripture, and that's why we believe we call it the Trinity, but what that just implies is that there is this, this union of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit who all work together for one perfect will of God, 
And that's, that's just the way we, we understand it. And so Paul captures it in this one verse. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, communion, which is a word fellowship, not communion as in bread and wine, but this is fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. That is, that is the grounds for the unity of the, of, the, of the fellowship, the unity of the faith. That's how we can be of one mind, is when we get rid of our mind and, and use the mind of the Trinity. To, and that's how we want to do things and see things and, and approach things with one another. So, and if we all will humble ourselves and work toward edifying others, there will be peace. Amen? Thank you, Lord, for a teaching in your word tonight, and we pray you'll help us to do just what we were exhorted to do. Turn away from the sinful things. Some of us, that means real repentance, as we turn away from what we shouldn't be doing and start pursuing the things that we want to be doing in the faith. And so help us, Lord, to have that high-mindedness, that spiritual-mindedness, as we start lifting others up around us and taking others into this communion of fellowship with Christ and with one another. We thank you, we love you, and we give you our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>